Good morning. I'm glad you're here this morning. We are working through a new series in the book of Acts, so we'll ask you to turn there and follow along where we're going to be this morning. Uh, we're going to be really in, in chapter 3 and 4. Uh, most of the script you'll see on the screen this morning will be from chapter 4, where the church is going to uh, pray together. And it's all about uh, them praying. And last week we talked about that the only way we'll be the church of Jesus Christ is to be a church who prays with one passion. That one passion is who? Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's only about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. And every time we get our eyes off of that, I mean, it's trouble. I mean, it's, it's, it is trouble. It's just, you're going to go down the wrong path. You're going to do the wrong things. You're going you're gonna to start thinking the church is about something else. You're going to try to entertain people. You're going to do all sorts of stuff because you forgot the one passion is Jesus Christ. So that's where we were last week. And we talked about that really for the next three weeks, just kind of set this up, powerful works, powerful gospel, powerful deliverance. That's where we're going to go. That's where we're going to see prayer at work in the book of Acts. Powerful works, powerful gospel, powerful deliverance. So today we start on powerful works, okay? And I want to read the first part because there's really it's really hard to put all the scripture up on the, on the screen. So I'd really encourage you to bring your Bibles if you have them. If you're online, we try to get as much as we can on there. But if you're in the room, I really encourage you to bring your Bibles so you can follow along with that. So I want to read the first 10 verses of Acts chapter 3. And I'm going to tell you why. Because this sets everything off that we're going to talk about today. Everything that's going to happen with them being before the council and ultimately the church lifting up the prayer is all in what happens in the first 10 verses of chapter 3. Most of you might have heard this before, you might have read this part before, but it's, it's just incredible. They, Peter and John are just going to be outgoing about their daily life, their, their ministry, stumble across somebody, and you're going to see what happens here. So I'm just going to read this to us so we kind of understand what is happening here. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time for prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Remember they were devoted to prayer? So guess what they're doing? They're going off to be a part of the temple seasons. If you lived in Jerusalem, you could go to the temple prayer, which was at certain times. They were going at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. A man, lame from birth, was being carried up, who was placed at the temple gate called the Beautiful Gate. Every day, he would go and beg for money from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple courts, he asked them for money, right? Ooh, here's two guys. Maybe they got some money they can give me, okay? So Peter looked directly at him, as did John, and said, look at us. So the lame man paid attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. Oh, this guy has gold, right? This guy has something he's going to give me. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, stand up and walk. Then Peter took hold of him by the right hand and raised him up. And at once, the man's feet and ankles were made strong. He jumped up, stood up with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized him. Wait a minute, that's the guy. Hey, that's the guy we walked past. Maybe they're all going, man, I really felt guilty. I didn't give the guy something. Maybe someone's like, man, I gave, him, I gave him a lot over time, or I know who that guy is. And they recognized him as the man who used to sit and ask for donations at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with astonishment and amazement at what happened to him. Simple thing. Simple thing. In that moment, God is going to work supernaturally, and he is going to heal this man. And it is going to set off this domino effect of all sorts of different things that's going to happen. and But you've got to know, before you read anything in the next couple chapters, it's that event. It's that event. It is that powerful work of God that causes everybody to go, ooh, all right, something's going on here, okay? I've seen that guy. I know that guy. I know who that guy is. And he's not sitting there anymore because he can't get up. He is healed. Something incredible has happened. The rest of the chapter, chapter 3, is dedicated to Peter preaching and telling everyone the man was healed in the name of Jesus. That's really important. 
He didn't stand up and say, guys, I'm awesome, aren't I? Okay? All right? You're, some, some down the road, they're going to call me up the first pope. Okay? He didn't do any of that stuff. Okay? It is all about Jesus. That's what he does. It is an opportunity to make sure they understand who Jesus is, why Jesus came, what Jesus did, and that all of that was done in the name of Jesus. That was really important. It wasn't time to show off. It wasn't time to ask for donations for their new church. Okay, It was time to bring glory to God and make sure everybody understood in whose name this was done. So, after that, I'm just going to tell you, people didn't like that. So Acts 4, 1 through 22, Peter and John are arrested, and they're put on trial for this powerful work because it's just causing uproar, right? And then, and then Peter's preaching again in the name of Jesus, and these guys are like, okay, we've had it. We've got to get him in here. Now, chapter 5, if you go ahead, I was a little off last week. Chapter 5, is they're going to be brought in again, and that is when Gamaliel stands up and says, uh, guys, you might be fighting against God. Just, just a thought. You might be fighting against God, and you don't want to do that. And so he reminds them of that. That's chapter 5, because they just keep bringing him in and saying, you've got to stop doing this. But they are arrested. Get, get, just get that, okay? In the name of Jesus, a man was healed. They were arrested and brought before this group saying, you've got to stop this. We're going to tell you now, stop using the name of Jesus. Stop using the name of Jesus. Now, we don't, we don't face that kind of stuff in our world quite often, okay? We don't. Some people do in certain situations and certain times. But what would you do if that was you? If that was us, and all of a sudden, it is illegal in America to, to gather. It is illegal to say the name of Jesus. What do we do at that point? Because that's what I want you to see. This prayer that we're going to walk through is the church's response to the threat. Okay, Because they've been told, now you're done. You're done. Stop saying this name. Stop using this name. Start ta stop talking about Jesus. You're done. What are they going to do? I mean, what are they going to do? What are they going to pray? Maybe I'd like you to think about that for a moment. What would you pray in, in that moment? What, what, what would you pray when all of a sudden it's all on the line? If you keep speaking the name of Jesus, if you keep following Jesus, if you keep reading the scripture, if you keep doing the things that Jesus tells you to do, and now it's all on the line, and you've been threatened. What are you going to do? Because I think you're going to find their prayer very interesting on what they prayed for. Um, I'm just going to tell you the word safe is nowhere in here. Okay? It is nowhere in here. And, and that's what we like. We like comfort and safe. All of us do. We can own that to a certain degree. We like comfort and safe. As long as we're comfortable and it's safe. And, in fact, we pray that all the time. We want to be comfortable and we want to be safe. And I'm just going to tell you, that's not in their prayer. So maybe we're praying the wrong things. Because that's not going to be in here. Neither of those words. So, so follow along with me on this. Just, just watch this prayer. So when they heard this, they raised their voices to God with one mind. By the way, that's our same word with one passion that we found in chapter 1. That same thing, that passion. So, so they are all together in one passion, okay? Everybody's, everybody's there. It's going to be all about Jesus and said. And it's like, oh, what are they going to pray? What are they going to ask for? What are they going to ask God to do in this moment? What are they going to say needs to happen so that the, this, this movement, this ecclesia, this church of Jesus continues on? Here it is. Master of all, you have made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and everything that is in them. They, they just acknowledge in the creator. Do you know why they have to do that? Because these men seem really powerful. You're standing for a council, and ooh, ooh, these guys seem big and bad and mean, and they can do anything. They can throw you in prison. They're in charge over things, and, you know, ooh, gosh. Well, they're scary. Let me tell you, no earthly authority is as scary as our creator God. None. I know it seems like it. Oh, they have the power to do all sorts of things. Yeah, they do. And they will wield that power. Okay? They will wield that power and they have no problem 
wielding that power. But this is why they prayed this way, because the first thing they had to do is get their eyes off of everything else, okay? And ooh, they're scary, and get their eyes up, which, by the way, is exactly what you see throughout the scriptures. What did Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego have to do? They had to get their eyes up because Nebuchadnezzar said bow. And they're like, no, we can't do that. <laughs> we can't do that. Daniel did do the same thing, okay? Because why? Because he was told, stop praying. You know, new edict, new law, you can't pray anymore. Okay, well, that's what I'm going to continue to do. Open the window and he prays. Why? Because he's looking up and he knows that God is honored and put first above all. If you don't have him first, then it's going to be very easy to give in to all the authority that's going to tell you to stop in the name of Jesus. So master of all, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything that is in them, who said by the Holy Spirit through your servant David, our forefather, so now they're going to, they're going to speak back. By the way, do you understand this? So often when we don't know what to pray, pray the scriptures. That's what they do here. Because they're like, oh, this is, man, we're in a tough situation. So they go back to what is called a messianic psalm, Psalm 2. And they quote this part. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot foolish things? The kings of the earth stood together and the rulers assembled together against the Lord and against his Christ. All from Psalms 2. It's a messianic psalm. And, and they're, just, they're just quoting that. Now, here's something I had to learn. When they give you a quote, they are really referring to the entire passage. Whether that's an entire section, they're really referring to everything. Do you know what it says just a little bit further in Psalms 2? It, it says this, serve the Lord in fear, repent in terror. I was like, oh, that's, man, they're thinking about all of this. Because they're like, the nation is raging, they are going against the Lord, they are going against his Messiah, and, and they're thinking what? Man, we're going to serve the Lord because he is first and above, above all, and we are going to fear him first before any of these guys who seem like they're really important. And we're going to make sure we live a life of repentance. That's what, that's what tells us people. So he goes back, for indeed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together in this city against your holy servant Jesus, whom you have anointed, to do as much as your power and your plan had decided beforehand would happen. This is really important too, right? They're not going, oh God, if you'd only spared Jesus, it would have been so much better. They said, no, 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 that was your plan. And you allowed them to do exactly what you allowed them to do. And I know they thought they were great, and they wiped out this guy, and they were going to get rid of this person, and, and no more this following Jesus. And y you know what? They were allowed to go as far as God let them go. And he goes, oh, you're done. And guess what? He's going to raise in three days. There you go. How, how are you going to deal with that? Do you see what he does? It's amazing. He says, I let them go as far as they went. He just, they are constantly reminded who is in control. And I'm telling you what, I have to be constantly reminded who is in control. You have to. You have to, if you're going to follow Jesus, be constantly reminded who is in control. Who is in control? I know you, you follow all the conspiracy theories. You think it's certain, you know, certain groups of people. And No, 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 no. I, I understand, right? They're pulling all the strings on everything. God is ultimately in control. And if we could remember that throughout our day, I'm telling you, it will help you. And so guess what they want needing to do? They need to be reminded, hey, you went, they went as far as what God had intended for them to go. And now, Lord, pay attention to their threats. They didn't ignore the threats. They're just like, uh, okay, we're being threatened. They're like, God, just attention, we're being threatened. Now, this is what I think is amazing. So they asked for two things after this. And I'm telling you, they're not safe or comfortable or, you know, strike them dead or, or any of this other stuff we might think. Look what they asked for, okay? Pay attention to their threats. Grant to your servants to speak your message with great courage. Wow. See, they knew the one thing that this was actually going to do is cause them to be silent. 
And they're like, oh, we, we can't do that. You have to help us not be silent. Because the, the easiest thing to do right now would just be, oh, just quiet down. Just shut it. Just, just stop mentioning this Jesus person, right? Just go around and be nice and kind and, and just do things. And just, just stop this Jesus talk. If you stop talking about this Jesus, everything would be better. They knew that's what they were inclined to do. Do you know that? Do I know that? That we're inclined to do the same thing. That in the face of threats, pressure, we, we'll just, oh, okay, we'll, we'll just not say that. We'll just be quiet. We won't talk about it anymore. And, and so do, do we know that, that that's what we're just, we're susceptible to? To just tone it down and be quiet and not say anything. They said, give us the courage to speak your message. Not ours, yours, who you are and what you have done, and what you are going to do for us. Wild, right? That's what we're going to do. We, we need your courage because we need to spread your message. While we ask you to do something, while you extend your hand to heal and to bring about miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. We, we need you to do things that people can't explain, just like that. We need you, Father, to do those incredible works that no, that everybody's just like, what's going on here? Oh, we can tell you. And that's why they go together. That's why like, we got to spread the message of Jesus, and we need you to do things that people can't believe are taking place and happening so that it would draw their attention to Jesus. That's what they're praying for. When he had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Like, didn't that happen? Yeah, yeah, they needed, they, 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 they needed to fill the tank again, just like you do with your car, okay? <laughs> they needed a refill, okay? They've just had a lot of pressure, a lot of threats, and they needed the Holy Spirit to refill them. So the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God courageously. Man. Don't we need that? We need courage to speak the gospel. We can't be silent. Can't. Can't be silent. That that Peter tells us later on, listen, you're going to do so with respect, but my goodness, you need to be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have inside of you. And maybe our problem is people look at us and they don't think there's any hope inside of us. That might even be scarier. They, they, we just look like everybody else struggling the same old ways in this, in this hard and difficult life, uh, living in, in, in this your broken, messed up world that we talk about all the time, that we just look like everybody else, and we don't look like we have any hope. So maybe they're not going to ask us because they don't see any hope within us. And then he goes, so, so be ready. Be ready to give an answer. Jesus, we need to, you to do what only you can do. Extend your hands, heal, and show everyone who you are. You understand? We need to do our part to know the word, to be ready to give an answer for the hope that's inside of us. That means we better be showing that there's hope inside of us. And then, Jesus, we need to do what only you can do, to do things that are unmistakable, that, that are just not normal, that don't normally happen, so that people will get their attention fixed on you, maybe if they've never been before, and we can help them know who you are. So my question is, is this how we do it? Come on, it's easy to know. Right, right, we just got about, no, no, not really. Not really. I, I'm not trying to down all our prayer request lists, okay? But the, the, the problem isn't the list. The problem is this stuff isn't on it. That's really the problem. The problem is we've got everybody's, you know, broken toes and run over cats and everything else going on, and we don't even bother to pray for the salvation of people in our lives, that God would work in incredible ways, that he would open up doors in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces, that we might be able to talk about who Jesus is. Maybe that's the problem. That stuff isn't anywhere on our list of what we want and what we're asking God to do. Why? Let me, let me, because I think it's just easier to pray for other things. 
It's comfortable and safe. It just is. Man, if I got to pray for my coworker, what if God wants me to be the one to speak to him? That's not comfortable. That's not safe. That's neither one, right? That's why we don't like to pray that way. Yeah, but what if God says, okay, you're in. I'm calling in sick that day. I can't, I can't do this, right? And we can be honest about that. Our hesitation, our lack of just being willing to share with somebody else what Christ has done in our lives. What it's like from going from death to life. What Jesus has done for us. What he continues to do for us. Why we live for him each day. And, and I think times it's just easy to pray for other things. Because it means we have an opportunity. We have to speak when given an opportunity. You have no idea when those opportunities come up. That's why Peter says, just be ready. Just be ready. You have no idea. It's going to be probably on the worst day, right? The, the, day you, the, the day the alarm didn't go off, okay? Uh, the day that everything made you late, okay? And you're already in a bad mood. It might be on that day that the opportunity comes up. And you just go, oh, Lord, anything but this day, right? Can we have any other day but this day? Because you already feel so drained by what's gone on in your life that you have no any type of courage and strength to speak in those opportunities. Do you know, I, I love this quote. Preach the gospel at all times. If necessary, use words. If necessary, use words. Probably part of our problem is we don't look di any different than anybody else in our circles. And there's no reason, again, for them to ask about the hope that is inside of us. Let me talk about this for a moment. Signs and wonders make us nervous. And I'm going to tell you why. At least in my opinion. Here's, here's my opinion point right here, okay? We've seen too many fakes. You've had people in your family, you know, give to that guy and plant their seed money for their miracle. Okay, could you imagine that in the scripture? Where Peter and John go to the guy, and he and they're like, hey, listen, listen, you got a gold coin? Because for a gold coin, you can plant a seed for your healing. I'm telling you, that's the people we have out there. And I'm going to be real on them for a moment because this stuff's ridiculous. And, and, and there, are, there are elderly people who just keep writing out the check to the place because, oh, my goodness, my healing's coming. And you know what these individuals are doing? They're making a lot of money off of people. By the way, things you shouldn't Google, okay? Things you shouldn't Google, okay? And I know when I say this, you're all going to Google it, okay? Things you shouldn't Google. I should have listened to Dan, and I didn't want the answer. I shouldn't have asked the question, right? <sighs> Richest pastors in America. You don't want to Google that, by the way. You don't. It's depressing. Because these are the people, again, who have all these people sending their seed money for their miracle. While they're building up their personal, that just does not happen here. And that's what makes us nervous. We've seen the shows, the fakery, the charlatans. And what's that done for everybody else is just limited the power of God in our lives. Because we think it has to look kooky and weird and fanatical and people flopping on the floor and all this other stuff. And that's what happens to us. And we look at that and say, I'm out. So we take whole sections of scripture like this, and we're like, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think I want to deal with that. Well, we just, you know, we have people who just have, they have a whole doctrine about it. We just rip it out. Eh, it doesn't happen today. This is simple, okay? doesn't happen today. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. And you and I know people who God has touched in such a way that has healed them miraculously and has worked incredible ways in their life. You and I know people. So we know better than to go that way. I think we just don't know what to do. Okay? So don't lose heart because of fakes. Don't. Because that's not what happens here. Peter and John make no silver or gold off that healing. That healing was about Jesus doing such a work that it just dominoes the rest of, this, the, rest of the book of Acts here for a while. It all goes back to this guy who they say is 40 years old. Okay? 40 years old in their culture, you know, you're old, okay? 
So I know, we're all over 40, we're, we're terrible, okay? But uh, any of you under 40 feel good, okay? So, and that's what they're amazed at. Oh my goodness, he's 40. How could that happen? How could this, they're just blown away by what God does here. But I'm telling you, I think this is why we, we just depress this. And we really aren't sure what to do with this whole thing of miracles. And I'm telling you, don't give in to the lie and to the games that too many are playing. Forget about that. Forget about that. Well, everybody's sending their seed money out. They're not giving to their local church. And they're missing that opportunity that God has given them where they're at. Because, oh gosh, I got to give to this, this person. What, what amazes me, I'm going to tell you, I was a, I don't know, 12 year old kid when, when, when the Baker scandal hit. Okay? And some of you are going to remember that, some of you not. But the, but the picture of that, okay? And I've told you this before. The picture of that was the air conditioned doghouse. Now, I don't think there's anybody in here who has one of those, okay? And they, they, just, they just took a doghouse and they took an air conditioner and shoved it in the back. That was, that was the picture of their extravagant, we got to spend everything. Do you know what the shame of that really is? That people still go to the Branson area today and sit under Jim Baker and still give him their money. After all the times he has just shown faith. So I'm just telling you, don't dismiss God because of what some people have done in their own greed and their own hopes to get something more out of this life. Don't give up on that. Don't dismiss that because of this. Just expect Jesus to do what only Jesus can do. So it's time to pray for the powerful works that our city may know he is the king of kings and lord of lords. Powerful works just don't happen just to happen. They always happen to help people come to know who Jesus really is and to be a tool that God uses in incredible ways. So I tried to work on something this week, and I'll have some cards up here at the end. If you'd like to take one, uh, that's fine. I tried to put this into a prayer for us because sometimes it helps. Sometimes it helps to say, okay, well, all right, but so, so, so what, I, what am I supposed to do, okay? And so I've just, I've just worded this this way, okay? Father, give us courage to use the opportunities you give us to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. And do great wonders that our city may know who you are and turn to you. If we're going to if, if we're going to reach back and look at that and say, so what does that look like? 2024 in Central Iowa to pray together that prayer. I believe that's that's a simple way to put it. Father, give us the courage to use opportunities that you give us to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ and do great wonders that our city may know who you are and turn to you. So if you'd like some of these, I'm just going to leave them up here. I have a few of these cards. We run out. Great, I'll make more. If you'd like that to help you understand what they prayed for in the midst of everything that was going on. Man, give us courage to do what you've asked us to do. And then, Jesus, do what only you can do in such incredible ways that people cannot deny who you are and that you are at work and doing amazing things in our city. So I'm going to ask you to do something before I close. I'm going to ask us that we stand. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. But if you'd like to, I would encourage you to stand. We're going to pray this together. We're just going to say this together as a prayer. And then I want, I want to pray over us as our worship team comes up uh, to lead us in our final worship song. Our prayer team be over to the side. I always forget that until the very end when Zach reminds me and puts up the slide. They'll be over here. They would love to pray with you about anything that's happening in your life during this time, after this time, uh, whatever. Okay? Let's lift our voices. Father, give us the courage to use the opportunities you give us to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ and do great wonders that our city may know who you are 
and turn to you. Father, accept the prayer of your people as you did back then. As they chose to do what you had called many of them to earlier, to deny themselves, take up the cross and follow you. This just became their prayer. It wasn't about safe and comfortable. Man, it was all about you and your message. So we ask you to do just that. Would you open up opportunities? I know that makes us very nervous to pray that. But would you open up opportunities wherever we happen to be? The greatest gift that we could give someone is to lead them to Jesus, that they would be saved. And then, Father, would you do in our city only what you can do? That it would be undeniable, that you are at work. It would be unexplainable to our professionals in the medical field that they they don't know how this happens. We do. It's God. And he's doing a miracle. Would you do, Father, what only you can do? And forgive us at times when we try to profit off your miracles, off your wonders, off your signs. May we choose to follow you every single day with a heart fully devoted to you. Jesus, we lift up this prayer to you, offering the only name that we can pray in, Jesus, because you came died in our place, rose again for our salvation, ripped the curtain so we have access to the throne of life. In Jesus' name, 